plaid bow planted in her hair. Sullivan had decided one thing about her right away. Marianne was a little cocktease. That was all right with him. He liked to play games, too. I see. And Mr. Yates, Mr. Blake, Mr. James Joyce, weren't they before your time? He kidded her with his endearing smile turned on bright. Then he took Marianne's hand, and he lightly kissed it. He pulled her away from her bar stool and did a tight lindy twirl to the stone song playing on the jukebox. Where are we going? she asked. Where do you think we're going, mister? Not too far, said Michael Sullivan. Miss. Not too far? questioned Marianne. What does that mean? You'll see. No worries. Trust me. She laughed, pecked him on the cheek, and laughed some more. Now how could I resist those killer eyes of yours? Chapter 5 Marianne was thinking that she didn't really want to resist this cute guy from New York City. Besides, she was safe inside the bar on M Street. What could go wrong in here? What could anybody try to pull? Play a new kids on the block tune on the jukebox? I don't much like the spotlight, he was saying, leading her toward the back of the bar. You think you're another Tom Cruise, don't you? Does that big smile of yours always work? Get you what you want? she asked. She was smiling, too, though, daring him to bring his best moves. I don't know, M.M. -M. Sometimes it works okay, I guess. Then he kissed her in the semi-darkened hallway at the back of the bar, and the kiss was as good as Marianne could have hoped. Kind of sweet, actually. Definitely more on the romantic side than she'd expected. He didn't try to cop a feel along with the kiss, which might have been all right with her. But this was better. Whew! She exhaled and waved a hand in front of her face like a fan. It was a joke, only not totally a joke. It is a little hot in here, isn't it? Sullivan said, and the co-ed smile blossomed again. A little close, don't you think? Sorry, I'm not leaving with you. This isn't even a date. I understand, he said. Never thought you would leave with me. Never crossed my mind. Of course not. You're too much of a gentleman. He kissed her again, and the kiss was deeper. Marianne liked that he didn't give up too easily. It didn't matter, though. She wasn't going anywhere with him. She didn't do that. Not ever. Well, not so far, anyway. You're a pretty good kisser, she said. I'll give you that. You're holding up your end, he said. You're a great kisser, actually. That was the best kiss of my life, he kidded. Sullivan pushed his weight against a door, and suddenly they were stumbling inside the men's room. Then Jimmy Hatt stepped up to watch the door from the outside. He always had the butcher's back. No, 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 Marianne said, but she couldn't keep from laughing at what had just happened. The men's room? This was pretty funny. Crazy funny, but funny. The kind of stuff college kids did. You really think you can get away with anything, don't you? She asked him. The answer is yes. I pretty much do what I want, Marianne. And suddenly he had a scalpel out, the gleaming razor-sharp blade not far from her throat, and everything changed in a heartbeat. And you're right. This isn't a date. Now don't say a word, Marianne or it will be your last on this earth. I swear on my mother's eyes. Chapter 6 There's already blood in this scalpel, the butcher said in a throaty whisper meant to scare her out of her wits. You see it? Then he touched his jeans at the crotch. Now this blade won't hurt so much. He brandished the scalpel in front of her eyes. But this one will hurt a lot. Disfigure your pretty face for life. I'm not kidding around, college girl. He unzipped his jeans and pressed the scalpel against Marianne Riley's throat. But he didn't cut her. He lifted up her skirt, then pulled aside her blue panties. 
He said, I don't want to touch you. You can tell that, can't you? She could barely speak. I don't know. You have my word on it, Marianne. Then he pushed himself inside the college girl slowly, so as not to hurt her with a thrust. He knew he shouldn't spend a lot of time here, but he didn't want to give up her tight insides. Hell, I'll never see Marianne Marianne after tonight. At least she was smart enough not to scream or try to fight him with her knees or nails. When he was finished with his business, he showed her a couple of photographs he carried around, just to be sure she understood her situation, understood it perfectly. I took these pictures myself. Look at the pictures, Marianne. Now, you must never speak of tonight. Not to anyone, but especially not to the police. You understand? She nodded without looking at him. I need you to speak the words, little girl. I need you to look at me, painful as that might be. Understood? She said, I'll never tell anybody. Look at me. Her eyes met his, and the change in her was amazing. He saw fear and hatred, and it was something he enjoyed. It was a long story why, a growing up in Brooklyn story, a father and son tale that he preferred to keep to himself. Good girl. Strange to say... I like you. What I mean is I have affection for you. Goodbye, Marianne, Marianne. Before leaving the bathroom, he searched through her purse and took her wallet. Insurance, he said. Don't talk to anybody. Then the butcher opened the door and left. Marianne Riley let herself collapse to the bathroom floor, shaking all over. She would never forget what had just happened, especially those horrifying photographs. Chapter 7 Who's up so early in the morning? Well, my goodness, look who it is. Do I see Damon Cross? Do I spy Janelle Cross? Nana Mama arrived promptly at 6.30 to look after the kids, as she did every weekday morning. When she burst through the kitchen door, I was spoon-feeding oatmeal to Damon, while Maria burped Janny. Janny was crying again. Poor little sick girl. Same children who were up in the middle of the night, I told my grandmother, as I aimed a brimming spoon of gruel in the general direction of Damon's twisting mouth. Damon can do that himself, Nana said huffing as she put down her bundle on the kitchen counter. It looked as if she had brought hot biscuits and, could it possibly be, homemade peach jam, plus her usual assortment of books for the day, blueberries for Sal, the gift of the Magi, good night, moon. I said to Damon, Nana says you can feed yourself, buddy. You holding out on me? Damon, take your spoon, she said. And of course he did. Nobody goes up against Nana Mama. Curse you, I said to her and took a biscuit. Praise the Lord, a hot biscuit. Then came a slow, delicious taste of heaven on this earth. Bless you, old woman. Bless you. Maria said, Alex doesn't listen too well these days, Nana. He's too busy with his ongoing murder investigations. I told him that Damon's feeding himself, most of the time anyway when he's not feeding the walls and ceiling. Nana nodded. Feeding himself all of the time, unless the boy wants to go hungry. You want to go hungry, Damon? No, of course you don't, baby. Maria began to gather together her papers for the day. Last night she'd still been laboring in the kitchen after midnight. She was a social worker for the city, with a caseload from hell. She grabbed a violet scarf off the hook by the back door, along with her favorite hat, to go with the rest of her outfit, which was predominantly black and blue. I love you, Damon Cross. She flew over and kissed our boy. I love you, Janie Cross, even after last night. 
She kissed Janny a couple of times on both cheeks. And then she grabbed hold of Nana and kissed her. And I love you. Nana beamed as if she'd just been introduced to Jesus himself. Or maybe Mary. I love you too, Maria. You're a miracle. I'm not here, I said from my listening post at the kitchen door. Oh, we already know that, said Nana. Before I could leave for work, I had to kiss and hug everybody too and say, I love yous. Corny, maybe, but good in its way, and a pox on anybody who thinks that busy, scarily harassed families can't have fun and love. We certainly had plenty of that. Bye, we love you, bye, we love you, Maria and I chorused as we backed out the door together. Chapter 8 Just as I did every morning, I drove Maria to her job in the Potomac Gardens housing project. It was only about 15 or 20 minutes from 4th Street anyway, and it gave us some alone time. We rode in the black Porsche the last evidence of some money I'd made during three years of private practice as a psychologist before I switched full-time into the D.C. Police Department. Maria had a white Toyota Corolla, which I didn't much like, but she did. It seemed as though she was someplace else as we rode along G Street that morning. You okay? I asked. She laughed and gave me that wink of hers. A little tired. I'm feeling pretty good, considering. I was just thinking about a case I consulted on yesterday, favor to Maria Pugach. It involves a college girl from GW University. She was raped in a men's bathroom in a bar on M Street. I frowned and shook my head. Another college kid involved? She says no, but she won't say much else. My eyebrows arched. So she probably knew the rapist. Maybe a professor? The girl definitely says no, Alex. She swears it's no one she knows. You believe her? I think I do. Of course, I'm trusting and gullible anyway. She seems like such a sweet kid. I didn't want to stick my nose too far into Maria's business. We didn't do that to each other. At least we tried hard not to. Anything you want me to do? I asked. Maria shook her head. You're busy. I'm going to talk to the girl, Marianne, again today. Hopefully I can get her to open up a little. A couple of minutes later, I pulled up in front of the Potomac Gardens housing project on G, between 13th and Penn. Maria had volunteered to come here, left a much cushier and secure job in Georgetown. I think she volunteered because she lived in the gardens until she was 18, when she went off to Villanova. Kiss, Maria said. I need a kiss. Good one. No pecks on the cheek on the lips. I leaned over and kissed her, and then I kissed her again. We made out a little in the front seat, and I couldn't help thinking about how much I loved her, about how lucky I was to have her. What made it even better? I knew that Maria felt the same way about me. Gotta go, she finally said, and wriggled out of the car. But then she leaned back inside. I may not look it, but I am happy. I'm so happy. Then that little wink of hers again. I watched Maria walk all the way up the steep stone stairs of the apartment building where she worked. I hated to see her go, and it was the same thing just about every morning. I wondered if she'd turn and see if I'd left yet. Then she did. Saw me still there, smiled, and waved like a crazy person, or at least somebody crazy in love. Then she disappeared inside. We did the same thing almost every morning, but I couldn't get enough of it. Especially that wink of Maria's. No one will ever love you the way I do. I didn't doubt it for a minute. Chapter 9 I was a pretty hot detective in those days. On the run, on the move, in the know so I was already starting to get more than my fair share of the tougher prestige cases. The latest wasn't one of them, unfortunately. As far as the Washington PD could tell, the Italian Mafia had never operated in any major way inside D.C., probably because of deals struck with certain agencies like the FBI and CIA. Recently, though, the five families had met in New York 
and agreed to do business in Washington, Baltimore, and parts of Virginia.